Ciao! Here is a conversation with Richard Linares. Dr. Linares is an assistant professor at MIT's Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics and is the co-director of the Space Systems Laboratory. His research areas are astrodynamics, estimation and controls, satellite guidance and navigation, space situational awareness, and space traffic management. We start talking about his interest in space traffic management, focusing on the importance of modeling the space environment, the thermosphere, the ionosphere, and space weather. We discuss some of his works looking into reduced order modeling techniques like principal component analysis and dynamic mode decomposition for the modeling of the thermospheric density field. We then discuss the use of machine learning techniques like autoencoders and neural networks more in general as promising generalizations without neglecting their downsides. Discussing the use of the Koopman operator theory in the same context, we move to its relevance in low dimensional, high nonlinear dynamical systems encountered every day in astrodynamics. We talk about its use for the study of the Earth gravity field and for the construction of halo orbits in the restricted three body problem. We discuss its implications for the engineering community, talking about optimal control, estimation, and uncertainty quantification about which we also outline the unification potential of techniques such as polynomial case expansion and differential algebra. We then look into the potential of the coupon operator for dynamical system theory in space. We discuss its potential for the analysis of invariant manifolds, its limitations for the study of chaotic systems, and finally its relation to the Hamiltonian formulation of classical mechanics. I hope you enjoy it. To support this project, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, connect with me on Twitter and LinkedIn, and support me on Patreon with a monthly membership following the links in the description. So thank you very much for joining this conversation. Uh, it's really a pleasure to talk again uh, publicly this time, let's say, and uh, to go deep about... Uh, um, I, I may say our common interests, even if uh, uh, the majority of my interests in these topics came out of your work themselves. So it's not really my interest. So uh, it's better to say your interest. But yeah, I would uh, frame this conversation uh, uh, starting from basically your works dealing with the, the modeling and uh, uh, related application, related implications of the thermospheric density field. And uh, what you think, first of all, what, what you did there, uh, where you started from and what's What's the, the next step, let's say? Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to, to share my work and my thoughts with you. Um, and so, we, yeah, we, we've been looking at this problem. And so uh, my background is in space uh, situational awareness, uh, astrodynamics and space traffic management. And so, you know, that field uh, area of study to the general public um, doesn't really have a lot of meaning. Um, but in particular, what we're interested in is ensuring that that space is safe and accessible um, for current uh, generations of satellites and future generations of satellites. Uh, one of the key issues in space traffic management and astrodynamics is the predictability of orbits, in particular low Earth orbits, because those are very useful for scientific um, and uh, commercial applications. And so the issue in low Earth orbit um, as you might, uh, general public might not know, is that there's actually uh, some atmosphere up there. It's, it's a rarefied gas. So the, the amount of atmosphere is a lot less than we experience down here, but the, the velocities of the satellites are fairly large. So we're thinking about one kilogram um, per every cubic kilometer. That's the amount of, of atmosphere. In some cases, it could be less, so it could be about one gram um, for every cubic uh, kilometer. Um, so it's, it's fairly sparse, but you're traveling in low Earth orbit around seven uh, kilometers uh, per second. So you're going through a lot of cubic uh, kilograms of volume in your trajectory, and it, you're in microgravity. So any small perturbation will cause significant disturbances in your trajectory. Um, and there is weather in space, as some folks might not know. Um, that weather is a compl complicated multi-physics um, uh, uh, effect where the Earth and the Earth's atmosphere is heated by the sun. Um, the Earth's atmosphere has both neutral and charged particles. Uh, the, the neutral particles are not affected by the magnetic field of the Earth, the charged particles are. And as the Earth's magnetic field interacts with um, the sun and the solar wind, 
uh, these particles are affected by that. During uh, active conditions where the sun is fairly active, and by active I mean that the sun might have more sunspots, it's releasing more particles, solar wind uh, strength is higher, um, versus quiet conditions, which are nominally quieter than that, um, the atmospheric density can vary orders of magnitude. And if the satellites ex experience orders of magnitude variation in the density, then that can cause significant perturbations in the orbit. So this is something that we've known about for a long time and we've cared about um, in, in terms of the space uh, domain for a long time. The US Air Force operates a model. That area of the atmosphere is called the thermosphere. And the, the US Space Force, uh, formerly the US Air Force, operates a model called uh, HASDM. Um, and then so HASDM stands for the High Accuracy Atmospheric Density Model. It's determined uh, through calibration uh, satellites that are in orbit and are measured with radar. And those calibration satellites will calibrate parameters within HASDM. And we use that to improve our orbit uh, knowledge, our position estimates. Um, and what's keenly important in terms of these estimates is forecasting the position because we'd like to understand whether or not there are going to be any collisions in space because these collisions can generate debris causing certain orbital altitudes to uh, uh, be inundated with debris uh, which could reduce their their usability uh, for active satellites uh, there have been uh, the deliberate debris events like the re recent Russian ASAT tests, but we'd like to avoid, um, you know, accidental debris events uh, by predicting forward position of satellites using our known laws of physics and the atmosphere and ensuring that they don't come close to each other. And if the atmosphere is very uncertain, that can be hard to do. So my work is really centered around that. That's kind of a high level description of mm -hmm. what we do. Um, and so we want to build thermospheric models so that we can improve the knowledge of position of satellites in low Earth orbit. Okay. And uh, uh, to introduce your work uh, more in detail, uh, uh, it's important to state that uh, there are empirical models and physics-based models of the thermosphere. And uh, your work kind of sits in between those because you, you're trying to leverage both advantages and try to reduce yeah. the... Definitely. The negative side. So, yeah. if you could so introduce the idea of this gray box model, this in between. Between, yeah. So, um, in particular, in this domain, it might be the case for other domains. Empirical models have been important. And what's an empirical model? An empirical model includes some physics. And I'll give you a simple explanation of what that could be. Uh, for example, you might assume that a hydrostatic. Uh, fluid, where the fluid is uh, essentially constant. And so we have laws uh, that physical principles that model uh, pressure, temperature, and volume for static fluid in a gravitational field. And so from that, we can determine potentially a density distribution. So density would be uh, computed if you had um, pressure, temperature, and volume model, you can infer density from that. And if you do that, you get an, ex an uh, exponentially varying density, varying exponentially with height. And that's common. And that's what we, we, we know fairly well. So that can build uh, a somewhat of an empirical model because now you have this exponentially varying density. And then from that, you can estimate parameters. So that's essentially what an empirical model is. And there exists really a few of them, but there's, there's uh, I think, three of them that are uh, very useful. Um, that's EMSIS, and EMSIS is a, 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 the Naval Research Lab has a model. It's called NRL EMSIS. Uh, they have multiple versions of this, um, but this model is an empirical model, and it works in the same way, just more complicated physics mm -hmm. instead of a hydrostatic model. There's Jakia Bowman, which is uh, related to what the Air Force is using, and Jakia Bowman is an empirical model, and there's also something called HASDEM, and HASDEM uses ideas from Jakia Bowman, but it, it is structurally a slightly different model. And those are empirical models. They, they need to be fit with data. Whereas first principle physics-based models essentially are derived from first principles. You have some fundamental understanding of conservation of energy, momentum, and you fold those all in with laws of thermodynamics uh, to model the very basic governing equations. And then you set up these governing equations with initial conditions and you simulate uh, that model, which can be fairly complicated. These are partial differential equations, multi-physics models. Um, so these are the two types of models. They have benefits 
and they have downsides. The benefits of empirical models is usually they're pretty fast. They can do climatology fairly well, and climatology is like general trends as opposed to specific predictions. So they can tell you things like, in general, if you have this F10.7, this is roughly what the density is going to look like. So, um, you know, you can think about this, what we know uh, in terms of weather. So the difference there is, is weather on a very specific day and climate. Climate and weather are different things, right? We can predict mm -hmm. climate, which is a sort of general bulk prediction, and we can predict very specific granular weather. And so uh, empirical models can do things like climate, but they can't do weather. And we need weather if we want to predict uh, very high accuracy, um, the position of satellites. Has them sit somewhere in between because it is uh, fit with data, so it, it can mm -hmm. have higher accuracy information. Uh, the other empirical models are fit with historical data, and that's it. That's what you get, whereas has them is updated. The physics-based model, on the other hand, can do these predictions but they're very computationally expensive. They require high performance computing to, to do the prediction. Um, some of them are faster than others. So you can't really say general things about you know, models in this case, but in general, they're, they're slower than the physics-based model. And there's been a trend in scientific computing, which is how do we extract out information from these high, uh, highly computationally expensive models so that we can use them for, for analysis and other uh, things things like uncertainty quantification. So it's not new to this field, that trend. And within that trend, folks have been developing reduced order models. And that's really what we uh, started doing in this, in this domain, which is developing reduced order models using uh, physics-based models to capture some of the underlying physics in higher fidelity, and then uh, reducing the model so that it computationally can fit potentially on a satellite that runs on our laptops. And then we can do things like uncertainty propagation, data simulation, we could do different studies with these models, and that's the benefit of doing it. They're not to replace the physics-based models, because ultimately we do want those as ground truth, but they're, they're there to enable new applications, new things that we can't do with the physics-based models. Um, and for example, you know, space traffic management is becoming important because we have a, a lot more satellites that are going up on orbit. It's predicted that because of this mega constellation trend, we're going to have up to 30,000, 30, 40,000 potentially if you the FCC find new satellites on orbit active. And as the number of satellites increases dramatically, we need uh, computationally efficient methods to analyze the situation. And so we hope that these models can, can serve that middle ground. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and what are the mathematical ideas uh, used to develop these reduced order models? Yeah, the mathematical ideas are, and folks that are familiar with, with mathematics, um, and data analysis, you know, uh, are going to you know think about these ideas as being of fundamental and, and uh, have been known for a very long time. So mm -hmm. the ideas are not that new, but they're just methodologies that have been developed around those ideas that make them um, fit the new data structures that we have, like high dimensional data, large data sets, talking about gigabytes worth of data. Uh, so the idea is principal component analysis or or some folks might know it as um, empirical orthogonal functions um, or proper orthogonal decomposition. And the idea there is that you take a large data set and you look for the main um, modes in that data set through a singular value decomposition. So you're looking, if you think about a data set as a collection of vectors, you're looking for important vectors in that, in that space, uh, vectors that represent the highest uh, amount of energy. And by energy, I mean like, you know, the, uh, the strongest uh, uh, correlation direction from your data, the highest amount of correlation energy. And those are called uh, your principal directions or your principal components. And then assigned with each principal component is, is a singular value. So we can compute things like a principal component decomposition and use singular values to truncate our model. The singular values can be truncated based on their magnitude. Uh, uh, larger singular values uh, signify more importance of that principal direction. And that's the fundamental idea for, for the reduced order modeling. Built on top of that is something called dynamic mode decomposition, which essentially says that, well, these are not static data sets. They're actually dynamic and they have a time dependency to them. So instead of doing principal component analysis, 
Let's do that and then add some dynamics to it. So we add a dynamical system that evolves these modes over time. So they're not static modes, they're not time evolved modes. And, and that dynamical system is, is linear under that assumption. Uh, but the really interesting thing with dynamic de mode decomposition is we can add inputs. So dynamic mode decomposition with control is a formulation of that that adds inputs. And some of those ideas are relatively new. Dynamic mode decomposition is uh, somewhere around 2005 that that was invented. And then the addition of control was re re relatively recently in the 2010s that that was done. Mm -hmm. And so principal component analysis goes back to the 70s. So some old ideas with some new some new things that we're applying there as a community. Yep. Yeah, and one question I never ask you is, uh, do you think there are implications of this reduce order modeling for weather, let's say, because we said for climate, it's not really necessary, but for weather, do you think they're somewhat useful? I think it, it is useful. Uh, the challenge with weather um, is that we have a pretty nonlinear system in, in the upper atmosphere and pretty, it can get, it can get chaotic, but it is fairly tamed when we talk about weather uh, here on the ground. So like the, the chaotic behavior of weather and it's just, you know, the butterfly effect and, and things like that um, make it extremely difficult to, to do these types of techniques in a broad scale uh, for weather. Now, that's not to say that folks haven't done it. And I've seen papers and research papers. Um, it's just, you know, whether or not these are going to be the weather models that you're going to get your um, um, Tuesday morning forecast. It's Tuesday here um, in Cambridge. Um, probably not from dynamic mode decomposition just yet until we we see uh, more development in these directions. Um, and there have been some um, extensions of dynamic mode decomposition. Like I said, it's a linear method, uh, but folks have been looking at nonlinear versions of that, including um, by adding neural networks. And I think those versions have a lot of promise at predicting um, uh, highly nonlinear systems like our like our weather system. So about this, uh, one of your latest uh, work as we speak is about the application of autoencoders for reduce order modeling and neural networks for the prediction step, let's say, as a substitute of dynamic quantity composition. So do you think uh, that's a promising uh, idea? Yeah, it's very promising. And I think for certain applications it's somewhat necessary. Um, so the, the DMD with control, we've shown in past works published in the Space Weather um, Journal, that it can do fairly well compared to satellite data. So the, the points of comparison we have are satellites like Champ and Grace that have high accuracy accelerometers on board. Um, and then new satellites are the swarm satellites. And so comparing to those satellites, we've shown really good performance. We're about like around five to 7% error. And in, in this domain, that's probably the best you can do. Mm -hmm. um, you can might get a little better, but that's just the best that we've seen so far in, in thermospheric modeling. Um, so dynamic mode decomposition does well in general, but they have very specific cases where it's not that great. And those cases tend to be where we have high nonlinearities. So during an active storm or when you're forecasting large um, forecasting periods. Mm -hmm. uh, nominal periods about like one or two days are okay for dynamic mode decomposition, but anything beyond that, um, it starts to struggle. And I think that's where neural networks can show uh, um, their power because after the, that many days, you do have built up nonlinearity that starts to manifest itself when you're forecasting that forward in, in time. And during active storm conditions, it's a highly forced system. The sun is, is a strong forcing function for the atmosphere. So since it's a highly forced system, neural networks have some opportunity there. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, all of this needs to be coupled with a sun model, right? Um, our accuracy in predicting the thermosphere is reliant on predicting the, what the sun's gonna do. And I think neural networks have something to say there as well. So um, it seems that for these types of, for those class of problems, long-term prediction and chaotic conditions, uh, since the sun is, is such a forcing function and things mm -hmm. become fairly nonlinear, that's where I think neural networks, you need to go with neural networks. There aren't, um, in my opinion, and the other data-driven techniques that could um, do that efficiently. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted to point out what you said uh, uh, when we talked uh, a couple of weeks ago um, about the, uh, the the comparison between uh, autoencoders and uh, proper orthogonal decomposition. It's interesting to see that indeed proper orthogonal decomposition gives you modes which are smooth in time uh, compared to 
uh, autoencoders. And uh, uh, that's really interesting because then it means that uh, it's not really, that, I mean, the, the, the main behavior is not really stochastic. If there's stochasticity, that's because the, 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 the driver is stochastic. Uh, and not that necessarily there's a stochastic intrinsic behavior in the reduced order model of the thermosphere. Not sure if yeah. that was what you were saying last time we talked. Yeah. So, um, you know, on that particular effect, um, I'm probably going to rely on some of our colleagues that are, are hardcore modelers. But um, I will say a few comments, at least from our experience. And I think, yes, I think, yes. Uh, what we've seen is it's the stochastic behavior that we tend to see is mostly from the forcing function. Um, and the thermosphere is, it tends to be very smooth, the thermosphere. Um, and that, you know, that might be just a thermodynamic effect, right? Because you're really mm -hmm. looking at like these particles, they're extremely small. And we're talking scales of like hundreds of kilometers, you know, that yeah. we're not dealing with those scales usually on, on, on the earth because the atmospheric layers, uh, and what I mean on the earth, I mean like for terrestrial applications, the atmospheric layers that are important for weather prediction are not that big, um, but the thermospheric layer is large in comparison. Um, we're talking about altitudes from 125 kilometers and then depending on how you define it, you can go all the way up to 800 kilometers. Um, that's within the realm of what we wanna predict within the thermosphere. So it's a really big range. Um, and you're talking about, you know, particles, right? That, that's the main thing that exists in this, in this area are these particles. Um, so the thermodynamic principles for the thermosphere probably cause uh, that to be a very smooth type of function. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the ionosphere um, is not as smooth as a thermosphere. Okay. Right. It's much more complicated. Um, and particles are, are precipitating uh, vertically through, through the, um, the magnetic field. And so it can cause localized effects um, and those two things are coupled. They're highly coupled. And that's why, you know, when, you know, we think about these models, physics-based models are usually ionospheric, thermospheric coupled models that both are coupled. Mm -hmm. um, but the effect we care about is smooth. Right. So I, I think that's why we see such smooth behavior. And then any stochasticity we see in this effect, which is the thermosphere, um, is mostly from the sun, right? So mm -hmm. that motivates kind of these smooth functions um, but I think folks at modeling will say that no, in the ionosphere, you will see some things that are not as smooth as this thermosphere. Mm -hmm. And then there, I think maybe some of these stochastic models become really important. And they're coupled, right, right. together, the ionosphere and the thermosphere. Right. But uh, the holy grail, I think, is data driven modeling, um, which is something that we're working towards, um, you know, but we, we haven't necessarily done, is a fully coupled, high dimensional reduced order model, right? At some level, you know, when you're doing reduced order modeling, like when is it really a reduced order modeling model or you're just a full order model, right? Because mm -hmm. if you include so much effects. Um, but there are some relevant physics in the ionosphere. And I think that's an open area that folks haven't uh, looked at too much, which is reduced order models for the ionosphere, reduced order models for the thermosphere, and then bring in a reduced order model for the sun. Right. Um, and do you I think, think this has implications also for the prediction of uh, the thermosphere density? And therefore, let's say, keeping the focus on uh, uh, space traffic management. Uh, yeah, it, it'll have uh, pr uh, implications for that. Um, I think right. it'll probably increase the accuracy because, um, you know, a lot of the ionosphere coupling in our model is really handled by the input. So mm -hmm. uh, the input matrix B tries to handle all of that coupling input matrix B. And there's only so much you can do with that reduced order model. Um, and then that coupling is going to have some dynamic behavior, some time lag that is essentially the ionosphere. And I think if you can do that coupling a little better in our model, which can be done if you, if you do some sort of separation, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think it will have a lot of benefit for space traffic management and long-term prediction of the atmosphere. Right. Great. And the, the final goal, let's say, or at least a byproduct of this is being able to do estimation and therefore uh, doing uncertainty propagation and conjunction assessment, as you said. So can you maybe maybe uh, explain a bit what's the idea there and where you see open opportunities in that part of the pipeline? Yeah, 
So uh, that's, you know, we started with a lot of this reduced order modeling work uh, going back to, I think our first paper was 2017, 2016, 2017. And, um, you know, the first goal was, can we represent some of these physics-based models in this way? And then um, building on that, uh, what we try to do as well is incorporate data. So if we can represent the physics-based model, how could we incorporate data? Um, and the really nice thing about something like dynamic mode decomposition is that it allows us to develop a linear model um, for the dynamics of, of the thermosphere. And once you have that linear model, and if you have linear observation, then you can essentially implement uh, a linear data. And we showed that, and we showed in one of our, our follow-on papers that you can do a common filter for the atmospheric density, the thermosphere, um, including data from satellites. And the reason you're able to do that is because the satellites are actually um, almost directly measuring the thermosphere, these satellites, the Champ and Gray satellites, because they have high accuracy accelerometers. And the high accuracy accelerometers are used to um, infer the acceleration due to density. And the way that happens is we have a, a gravitational field model. Um, we have other models for other perturbations, such as the moon, the sun, and those models are known to high level of accuracy. And so those models are subtracted away from the acceleration. And we have a drag coefficient model for the satellites, which actually has some uncertainty in it, but let's say it's within 5%. And then that drag coefficient model and the other accelerations could be used to infer what the density is at that altitude. So you have an orbit wise measurement of density which is a it's actually a linear observation because that's our state variable in our reduced order model. Um, so you have a direct uh, state observation. And so we can implement a common filter and we showed you could do that. And then, so beyond that, we said, all right, well, you know, one of the things that we wanna do is get global estimates of the, of the thermosphere. Um, you know, folks have shown that you can constrain the thermosphere with a few observations, but it's clear that having observations with geographic diversity, um, uh, wider ranges in latitude help, right? And these satellites are a fixed inclination, so their latitude ranges are going to be uh, fixed. Um, so having wider latitude ranges help. So how can we do that? Well, one thing we can do is we can treat space debris, for example, or anything that's up there um, that's not actively being controlled as point measurements. Why do we want to remove actively controlled satellites because those satellites are going to experience the atmosphere that's true but owner operators of satellites actually don't want their orbits to decay so as their orbits experience the effect of the atmosphere they correct it frequently and removing those orbit corrections from your data is um, time consuming mm -hmm. so what we like to do is just use uncontrolled satellites and there's plenty of them up there that are active but maybe don't have orbit control or even space debris that we can characterize their drag coefficients well for um, like rocket bodies, we can characterize their drag coefficients because they're mostly uh, cylinders um, and, you know, they tumble in certain ways. So we can kind of maybe characterize their drag coefficients fairly well. We can fit their drag coefficients well. And then so if we want to use satellites and use their perturbations, then that introduces nonlinearity because now we're not directly observing the, the density. We're observing the secondary effect. And then for that, we needed nonlinear filters. So we've been looking at things like um, square root uncentered common filters, and that seems to be sufficient, but you can think about methodologies beyond that, like Bayesian inversion um, and things like that to, to do the estimation problem. And that's great. So now once you have that, what you'd like to do is have uncertainty, right? So you want an uncertainty in the, your estimate of the density and then fold that uncertainty in your conjunction assessment. So we studied that problem and we formulated a methodology that allowed us to uh, calculate the uncertainty in the satellite's position when we're doing forecasting. So when you calculate the collision probability, you incorporate uncertainty and density. And we show that that, that can be a quite, quite an effect. But beyond that, there's actually a very subtle effect. And the subtle effect is that the position of the satellites, if you assume them to be uncorrelated, um, two different satellites that are going to collide, mm -hmm. and you have estimates, you really can't assume that they're uncorrelated. And the reason why is that they're flying through the same density. And that density um, to you has some uncertainty in it right? Because you don't know it perfectly. No. And you have a model that estimated that, that density, whatever model you choose to use. And that uncertainty causes those two positions to be correlated. And so their covariances, when you include that uncertainty, have some correlation. And so we worked out the math for that, and that improved uh, the collision probabilities. 
uh, mm -hmm. for low Earth orbit. Right. Right. And related to, uh, let's say, linearity, and nonlinearity, you mentioned uh, uh, different uh, ideas of estimation. Uh, do you think there's also room and need uh, to look into non Gaussianity as well? For example, I've been thinking, uh, assuming you have a nonlinear reduced order model, yeah. if you do an estimation on uh, using Gaussian assumption, then your density is going to be non Gaussian. You know, the, yeah, yeah, I, I think you're right on point with that. So non Gaussian effects are going to be a problem. Uh, right now, in terms of our work, we, do, we actually haven't studied that. Um, but it, it's, it's, it's going to be a problem under a very specific scenario. And that's when you don't have observations, um, let's say for a period of time, or you're forecasting non Gaussian effects. And, and, and the forecasting is actually going to mostly be a problem if you're during a storm, which is actually a very critical time. Mm -hmm. The sun um, activity is high, the risk of satellites is high during a storm, right? Because you could have malfunction of the satellite from high energy mm -hmm. particles hitting your seat, all kinds of things like that could happen to the satellite. But beyond that, the atmosphere is fluctuating. So you're, you're having all these things happening during the storm, stressful period for a satellite in orbit. And so during that storm, you can see that like the atmosphere could have significant um, variations. And essentially what happens is the lower part of the atmosphere is heated. And as I said earlier, the atmospheric density varies exponentially with height. With height. So there's a lower part of the atmosphere that, that's heated mostly through UV. And that lower part of the atmosphere tends to cause it causes lower uh, uh, layers of densities to appear at higher altitudes as the atmosphere puffs up during that, that heating period. And um, you can have an exponential, almost exponential increase in, in the amount of density that you're seeing. So, and, and that can be fairly sensitive depending on the solar activity. So you can see bifurcations in the prediction depending on the solar activity, which will cause non-Gaussian effects in, in the prediction. And do you think that's relevant for, for example, conjunction assessment? Already with the traffic um, we are expecting in the coming years, or yeah, I think it could be relevant uh, for conjunction assessments if we're talking about uh, fifteen hundred satellites at mm -hmm. a given orbital altitude, okay. and these small perturbations can be significant. Um, you know what? What the, where folks are heading to with mega constellations is on, on board control, mm -hmm. right? So like a lot of it needs to be automatically, because um, you can imagine if we needed to handle. 40,000 satellites, and we had 40,000 humans on the ground coordinating all these satellites, there'll be enough confusion if we allow that to happen that satellites are, are going to you know, hit each other. So it needs to be done semi-autonomously. And, and for that, the satellites need to kind of know what's happening with the atmosphere. Um, so yes, I think once we have uh, lots of satellites on orbit and they're spread in latitude uh, and longitude, uh, just kind of talk, talking about these uniform um, spheres of constellations, um, these bifurcations that can happen will, will, will be important for that. Um, and then it also will depend on, on how f uh, much, you know, what um, level of prediction you need. So right. do you need five days, seven days, or are you just looking in the next six hours, 24 hours? It'll depend highly on that. If you're looking further, uh, you know, let's say f a few days ahead in the future, these non-Gaussian effects can become fairly important. Mm -hmm. Right. And so uh, uh, you think there's also a need to, to better model the, the space weather itself, to, to better be able to forecast the, the space weather. Uh, yeah. Can you maybe add something about that specifically? The yeah, there's a, strong, there? there's a very strong need to do that. So um, here in the US, um, you know, I think the United States government has recognized that um, that space weather is, is a big unknown and our society relies on all of these uh, satellites for communication and navigation and defense, um, that there could be a fairly big storm that arrives that can cause outages on, in space. Also on the, on the ground, space weather can affect communications on the ground, electronics on the ground. So during a, an extremely big storm, we're thinking about like a once in a hundred year storm or even mm -hmm. Uh, stronger storm than that, it can cause outages on the ground. So there's been significant investments here in the United States on space weather modeling and prediction. In particular, uh, there was an NSF pro uh, program for that. 
Um, it's called um, Space Weather with Quantified Uncertainties Program out of the NSF. We have a, a, a grant from that program, fairly large grant um, that's funding us, a large team at MIT in collaboration with um, University of Michigan and um, University of California, San Diego. And so our team is, is looking at how do we develop the next generation software for this? And we have elements of Julia um, in, our, in our team. So Alan Edelman is a, a um, co-PI um, of the team. So we have some applied mathematicians. We have some folks from the space side, myself, and we have modelers. Um, so our modelers include um, Aaron Ridley from the University of Michigan. He developed the GITA model. Um, GITAM is the global ionospheric thermospheric model. Um, and so NSF is investing in this. And so what we're trying to do, our project is mostly focused on the ionosphere thermosphere, as this discussion has mostly focused there. But there are other projects that are actually looking at different elements. And the goal is that we will all work to develop software infrastructure that'll help the nation do this prediction better. And then at the end of the, the project, which is three years, a lot of the teams will come together and share resources and code. So the projects that are doing the sun modeling and, and they're doing, there's some projects that are doing reduced order modeling for the sun. Some are doing uncertainty quantification. Uh, we'll make use of all of that. And so at the end of this, as a community, we'll have more resources to answer that question. But yeah, I agree. I think, you know, Congress is recognizing this. If we have a once in a hundred year storm or once in a thousand year storm, the effect could be pretty drastic. And, and it's the same thing that happened with COVID. You know, COVID is a once in a hundred year um, virus. And we had the last one during the Spanish flu. Um, we could have done more to prepare for that. And then so space weather could be an event like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we're trying to do with these projects is do more to prepare for it, have a better understanding of forecasting what the sun's gonna do. And if we did, do detect one of these big events, let's forecast it. Let's know when it's gonna happen before it happens. And let's give a warning so we can turn off critical systems. If we need to, like, let's say, turn off our power grid for 30 minutes so that we don't lose it, um, that could be something to do. All right. All right. So let me ask you a question going back to what we discussed earlier and to move forward with a more theoretical point, let's say. Um, we, we discussed a bit uh, the, the in between. Uh, uh, let's say that the compromise between using neural networks and dynamic model decomposition for the estimation of the, for the construction of the dynamics of the reduced order model. Uh, you have a work uh, uh, going deep into Koopman theory for that, and uh, you you then applied this Koopman formalism for a number of problems in orbital mechanics. Uh, could you maybe tell us a bit about the application specifically about the thermosphere, and then go into the other applications? Yeah, so um, this Koopman theory is really interesting topic that is gaining a lot of traction in um, the methods community, the mathematical methods community and computational analysis. Um, and the reason for that, because it has appealing properties. So in the 1930s, um, there was some, some desire to reformulate um, classical mechanics in an operator theoretic structures. And the desired back then was kind of to think about unifying classical principles with quantum mechanics. We now know that there are ways of doing that, um, how to have models that in a classical limit will give you classical mechanics from quantum mechanics. So there are other ways of doing that. But that was some of the motivation back then. And so there's a, a, a mathematician um, back then, uh, Koopman, um, and as well, uh, von Neumann uh, looked at this problem too. Uh, independently studied the problem of how to reformulate classical mechanics in an operator theoretic formulation and notice that there's this composition operator and um, which is the Koopman operator and is essentially like a composition between two functions. If you have a dynamical system, you can think about that as a map that will map initial conditions to some time. And then that map, if you compose that map with some general functions, let's say energy, for example, function of energy, and you're composing the map with that function of energy that gives you an operator. And that operator actually turns out to be a way of formulating um, classical mechanics in an operator theoretic framework. And so that's the idea that Koopman put out. He had this paper, I think it was 1931, where he formulated this and he showed that for Hamiltonian systems, it's a unitary operator. He showed some properties of the eigenfunctions of the operator and some additional properties about this operator. 
later on, and this is work I, I'm definitely not um, an expert in, von Neumann um, looked at ergodic systems and did his um, foundational work in, in like uh, ergodic theorem. And he used ideas from the Koopman operator to do that. So it was kind of a fundamental tool used in, in more of a theoretical uh, kind of proof. Um, so it was like an ends to a means, but it, it showed that this Koopman operator was important for that. Then, um, you know, it kind of, uh, the literature wasn't um, very active. Uh, there were some ideas in the 70s related to common linearization. What common linearization is essentially if you have a, a nonlinear system that's polynomial form, you can redefine your variables by choosing some of the polynomial variables to be your new variables. And, and then if you do that, you can kind of think, you know, think to yourself that, um, you know, okay, so I'm going to redefine some of my nonlinear variables to be new variables and expand my system. Um, but I need to know the dynamics for these new variables. If I go ahead and use a chain rule to calculate the dynamics for these new variables, I generate more polynomial variables. So that process is actually can continue indefinitely, but for certain systems, that process actually um, has a, a finite um, point where you actually have a new set of variables and your system is linear. And actually that's the property of the Koopman operator that's the most appealing. So the common linearization is related to the Koopman operator. And then the seventies, ideas from the Koopman operator and common linearization would notice to be similar. And there were some papers there. And then most recently, mm -hmm. folks uh, from the fluids community uh, revived the Koopman operator uh, idea. And the basic appealing element of the Koopman operator is that it's a linear operator. So it's a linear operator. So a lot of the ideas from, from spectral theorem we could use for the Koopman operator, just like any other linear operators. And, and as you might know, um, linear operators um, have a connection to matrix theory. So you can think about a linear operator as having a matrix representation. It's just that that matrix is an infinite dimensional matrix, a very large matrix. Um, so this linear operator can um, have some benefits, but the issue is, is that it's an infinite dimensional operator. So for practical uses, you have to truncate it. And the question is, is this truncation valid? And it's still an open question mm -hmm. on whether or not the Koopman operator can be truncated for finite dimensional systems in general. And I, I don't think that question has been solved. I might have missed a paper recently, um, solves it, but it's still a very open question. But it has been shown that even if that outstanding theoretical question hasn't been identified um, empirically, it performs fairly well for a lot of systems. So there have been applications in fluid mechanics that it's performed well. But the distinction for most of the work on the Koopman operator is it tends to be for high dimensional systems, a lot of the fluid mechanic applications, mm -hmm. where you kind of want to analyze some of the structures of the system. And interesting structures that arise in linear theory can now um, be uh, connected with nonlinear uh, effects. So in linear theory, we have eigenvalues and, and eigenvectors of a dynamical system. And essentially with the Koopman operator, we have similar things that arise, but now they become eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of the operator. And then these eigenvalues and eigenfunctions tell us about the temporal behavior of, of the dynamical system, so the, the spatial temporal coupling. So people have been using that to analyze nonlinear uh, dynamical systems and fluid applications. And there have been many applications since then in robotics. Our team has been looking at applications in thermospheric modeling and uh, astrodynamics. In the thermospheric modeling, the ideas are very similar to fluids because you can think about the thermospheric system as a fluid system. And so what we look for is we're doing reduced order models. Why not look at a Koopman um, sort of eigenfunction or a, a set of Koopman eigenfunctions as being your reduced order model? And then can you truncate those eigenfunctions um, to generate a finite dimensional reduced order model. And so we've looked at that. We've had fairly good success with that. And there's still a lot more work to be done. And then, you know, that actually motivated, that's where we got into the Koopman operator, looking at it uh, mm -hmm. from the thermospheric standpoint. That motivated our work in astrodynamics, which is a totally different type of application. So there we have a very low dimensional system, but a lot of uh, nonlinearity. Yep. So um, specifically the two body and three body problem. Yeah, and can you expand a bit on that? Because I'd like to zoom in the, the moment in which you realized uh, there was potential in applying this idea to uh, low dimensional, uh, strongly nonlinear dynamical systems. Uh, where did this idea come? Yeah, um, right. So when that happened, 
it really came from sort of thinking about those problems and knowing that there, there's an opportunity and especially the two-body problem, there's an opportunity. So the two-body problem is integrable, right? Yes. Um, so we have just strict two-body problem. It's integrable. We have uh, uh, solutions for that. There's, you know, you have Kepler's equation, which is is kind of a nuisance when you're solving the two-body problem, but there's ways around, around Kepler's equation. Um, so the two-body problem, we, we kind of know how to solve. But within the two-body problem, there have been these transformations that folk have been using um, that have transformed the two-body problem into oscillators. And, and it's just well-known transformations where you can transform a problem into a, a, li a linear oscillator. And so uh, my knowledge of, of these transformations got our group thinking that, you know, there could be mm -hmm. connection with the Koopman operator there. But the challenge of the two-body problem was not, you know, solving the two-body problem because that's an easy one, but how do you include perturbations? Right. And so that was our initial work, uh, you know, in the Koopman, actually, we, we started with the three-body problem, but where we started making a lot of progress was there. And uh, why is it useful for these low dimensional systems? Well, it turns out that there, there's been a lot of theoretical frameworks that have been proposed for both the two body and three body problem. And if you look for the certain property in your dynamical system, there's a lot of formulations, uh, a lot of versions that look differently, have different properties. But if you look for a property where the dynamical system is polynomial, their approach is to model the matrix representation of that operator, which is essentially computing inner products um, between vectors, uh, functional, uh, think about functional vectors, but inner products between functions. So uh, we're taking an inner product between uh, basis functions and, for example, a basis function that is operated on by the Cooper and another element from my uh, function space. And that is used to form the matrix representation. We notice that you can do that in closed form for certain types of um, astrodynamic applications. If we could do that in closed form, then we don't necessarily need to do the computation like it's, like it's done in um, other domains. So that was the opportunity for this problem, which is avoiding data-driven computations and essentially arriving at uh, an analytic theory. Ultimately, if you want to use eigenfunctions, you'll have to call it a semi-analytic theory because we do need to calculate the eigenfunctions that involves an eigenvalue composition, but there, we have ways of actually doing that analytically too. Um, and I can discuss that later, but it's an analytic theory, a Koopman analytic theory on, and there, there have been analytic theories before for simplified systems. Um, so folks have shown those in their papers, very simple systems where they can analytically derive the eigenfunctions and eigenvalues. So that was the whole motivation for doing it. We, we did that and we showed that actually you get pretty good results uh, for the three-body problem and uh, two-body problem. For the two-body problem, it involved um, a new formulation of the problem, actually, because we wanted to include uh, the main gravitational perturbation, perturbation called J2, at least, but we actually formulated it so we can include all zonal harmonics. Uh, so folks that don't know about what the zonal harmonics are, uh, the Earth's gravitational field is not, is not perfectly spherical. If it was perfectly spherical, we can represent the Earth as a point mass and its gravity is emanating from that point mass. But since it's not perfectly spherical, we have to model, model the spherical distribution of mass of the Earth. And um, we can do that using something that's called spherical harmonic functions. And then these are functions that are harmonic on a sphere, essentially how they sound. Um, but the spherical harmonic functions will have coefficients, like how much of you know, this harmonic function do we see in the Earth's gravitational field? Uh, the, and the way that the spherical harmonic functions work, there's two types. There are ones that depend um, only on latitude, and that's the elevation angle uh, on the Earth's surface, and the ones that depend on lat are uh, only on longitude, and there's some that depend on both. So usually they have two indices. The first index, index is referring to the latitude dependence, and the second index is referring to the longitude dependence. And the main term for the Earth kind of makes the Earth look like a football. Like you think about that as an ellipsoid football shaped earth. And that J2 effect is fairly strong. That effect is um, three orders of magnitude greater than all the others. Um, and so we needed to model that if we wanted to have any kind of good model around the earth. And in the 1950s and 60s, that's the approach that folks started with with analytic models. 
In order to do that with the Akuman operator, it turned out to be tricky. We wanted a polynomial representation, so we had everything in closed form. So what we did is we, we actually took uh, an idea from the 70s and uh, 60s, which is this, this idea of an extended state space, which is not new in actual dynamics, but the extended state space allowed us to simplify the problem. So what's an extended state space? We actually introduced new variables and we introduced these variables so theoretically it caused um, the equations to simplify. So the states in natural dynamics is six dimensional. Our extended state space, we had different formulations, um, turned out to be eight, eight dimensions. We needed two additional dimensions. The really neat thing about that is when we did that um, and we just looked at the two body problem, we instead of having a single harmonic oscillator with a single frequency, we had two harmonic oscillators with two frequencies. Um, for the two-body problem, we know that there aren't two frequencies. There's a single frequency, right, for the two-body problem. Mm -hmm. um, that frequency is the mean motion of the orbit, just how the orbit goes around in its motion. But actually, if you linearize a two-body problem around um, an orbit and you compute from that linearized dynamics, you compute the relative motion, you'll see that, in fact, there's two types of frequencies there's one frequency in the xy plane in the relative motion. That xy plane is the radial and intract motion. Mm -hmm. And there's a z frequency. So it, it, you kind of see those two frequencies when you linearize them. But then when you start including um, nonlinear effects such as j2, those other frequencies are there. They become important. So for example, if you include the j2 effect um, in orbital elements, if you do um, variation of parameters to have an orbital element model, a dynamic orbital element model with semi-major axis eccentricity inclination, right ascension descending node, um, argument of perigee, and let's say mean anomaly or true anomaly as your variables instead of position and velocity. Um, then it, under two body, all those variables are constant except for the true anomaly. Under J2, we know that those variables vary. Um, if we average it over one orbital period, which is a common thing to do for J2, we know that our semi-major axis is constant. Um, we know that uh, our uh, right ascension descending node will vary. That's the precession of the plane. But it turns out if our eccentricity is not zero, even under that simple J2 averaging, we see that um, we have uh, variation in the argument of perigee. So we'll have changes in the frequencies. There'll, there'll be a variation in the argument of perigee and um, there'll be a change in our main frequency, which is um, the right ascension of, sorry, the, the, the true anomaly, the main frequency. So we'll see these frequencies manifest themselves just with J2. So there, there are actually two frequencies that show up with J2. Um, our model starts with a harmonic oscillator that has two independent frequencies. For the, for the two-body problem, they're actually the same. They turn out to be the same frequency and we can normalize it so that frequency is one. And then when we add J2, these two frequencies um, will independently perturb to, to generate those frequencies I mentioned earlier. Under previous models, essentially that you start with a single frequency that bifurcate into two. So we have a model that generates two harmonic oscillators initially, and then you, you can study the effect of the frequencies of those harmonic oscillators. And then within the Koopman operator, what that allowed us to do is that everything is calculated in closed form. And then we can study the effect of perturbations on frequencies using the Koopman operator and its eigenvalues, which was a really um, kind of neat thing. And it also gave us a, a linear representation, representation for propagating our dynamical system. So sorry to explain that in a lot of detail, but- No, no, folks, great. Perfect, perfect. So people know where to jump in from. Yeah, I might not necessarily follow all of that, but that was really the benefit of doing that for that paper. Um, and then we also had the three body problem paper, which was, was interesting. Um, there you can formulate the three body problem as a polynomial representation more naturally. Um, there's a transformation that, that was used by Richardson in the 1980s to uh, compute high accuracy halo orbits. Mm -hmm. And that transformation was used then, but it's been popular in the literature essentially uses Legendre polynomials to convert the, perturbate, the per perturbing function of the three-body problem into an infinite expansion that's polynomial. So the downside there, as opposed to the, the uh, two-body problem formulation we had, is now you have an infinite expansion for your dynamical system, um, which as long as you're studying the problem near a libration point, a lot of stuff happens near libration points. That's mm -hmm. where things become very interesting. Uh, it works really well. 
and you can take it to high order. So this has been done in the literature. You can take these models up to like, for example, order 30, and they approximate the dynamics fairly well, but they're completely polynomial. What does that mean for us is that we have an analytic computation of the Koopman operator now. And so we can analytically comp compute the Koopman operator for the three body problem. And we've shown that actually that allows us to predict um, some of the locations of the periodic orbits in the three body problem, things that are known, um, but also allows us to model uh, fairly nonlinear orbits like halo orbits. So the halo orbits only exist because of the nonlinear effect. Um, under linear motion, they don't exist. Um, because if you look at linear motion, for the three body problem, the linearized frequencies, the in plane frequency in the three body problem has a certain value, and the out of plane frequency has a different value. If you have two frequencies with two different values, you can't generate three dimensional motion that's periodic. It can only be quasi periodic, unless those frequencies have a relationship that they're an integer multiple of each other, which they don't in general. Mm -hmm. So the halo orbits really don't exist in the, in the linearized three body problem. But then when you add the nonlinear effect, what happens is the perturbations, the nonlinear perturbations can allow you to change the frequencies. And so if you start, um, for example, like I said, there's one frequency in the XY plane. So if you have no Z component, then in the XY plane, you can have periodic motion for sure. And those are the Lobanoff orbits. And if you start with this periodic motion in the XY plane, and then you expand, you move further away from any, from the Lagrange point, which are your equilibrium points, you get more and more nonlinear the further you move away from the Lagrange point. And you kind of expand that radius, you'll start to see that the Z frequency changes. And the Z frequency will change until it matches the XY frequency. At that value, at that um, sort of distance away from the Lagrange point, you find a bifurcation. And the way you detect that dynamically is you, you look at something that's called uh, the Mollingeroni matrix, which is essentially the state transition matrix. And a state transition matrix will have um, a new periodic eigenvalue that just pops up at that point. And that's the bifurcation, where the Lopinoff orbits can bifurcate. So you can continue expanding the radius and get larger Lopinoff orbits, or you can go in that new bifurcation direction and go vertically. And you have a periodic motion vertically, and those are the halos. Um, and then the halos themselves can, can continue increasing in size. Um, so those, that's really what happens in the three body problem. And, and that's nonlinear. Turns out that the Koopman operator can actually model that fairly efficiently. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there are some challenges that still exist, which are chaotic systems, for example. So that, you know, there's chaotic motion in the three body problem. Um, but what tends to happen with a lot of these analytic methods and chaotic motion, is that's, that chaotic motion is somewhat ignored, really, in the analytic methods, um, at least the, the, the ones that are not specifically designed to incorporate that. Mm -hmm. um, so they work for the re regions of, of the three-body problem that are, don't exhibit high chaos. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever looked at one of these pretty Poincaré maps, you'll see that there are some regions that won't generate chaotic initial conditions. They'll generate periodic and quasi-periodic, and they're regions that generate a lot of chaotic initial conditions. So that's still an open question. Um, so hopefully that gives you kind of a high level overview of our three pro three body yeah, problem. Definitely. Let me state why I started being interested in this Koopman formalism. I came from a certain quantification in uh, dynamical systems with known symbolic expressions. And so uh, my interest came from the fact that I think a lot of the uh, existing techniques for uncertainty propagation that go together with a lot of ideas in estimation can be brought back to the analysis of the dynamical system itself, which allows you to efficiently do uncertain quantification. For example, uh, polynomial case expansion. It's really similar to approximate the Koopman uh, generator and operator using orthogonal polynomials. Um, and so the comparison with polynomial case expansion is nice. Also, the idea that you said about incorporating nonlinearities uh, with an, a linear formalism. Uh, gives me an idea that maybe we can use the same formalism to, to do the jump from the state transition matrix to the state transition tensor, which takes into account nonlinearities. So do you see some, uh, let's say, implications on uncertainty gratification from this work? Yes, I do. Um, so we are preparing a paper looking at, uh, in our past paper, a three-body problem paper, we kind of looked at that question just in passing. And the reason we did that, and it wasn't, you know, a paper focused on uncertainty quantification mm -hmm. or estimation, but 
you know, the, the, the implicit motivation of doing all of this, of doing the coupon operator is for that. Like that's implicitly involved in the motivation. Why do we want a linear representation in general? Why? Um, but the reason why is because there are a lot of linear methodologies for these, um, I, I would call them um, num numerical uh, methods applied to dynamical systems, um, like control applications, optimal control, uh, uncertainty quantification, estimation, kind of those methods apply to dynamical system. There are a lot of linear methods in that in those areas that work fairly well. So in controls, we have linear theory that works really well. And a lot of people use them for nonlinear systems, even if you know they're not directly um, exact for those systems. And then in estimation, we have the common filter. In uncertainty quantification, we have linear covariance analysis. Um, and so if we could derive a system where we could use those methods now in nonlinear system and have a theoretically kind of um, nice fitting framework for all of that, that's the implicit assumption for all of this. And so what we did in our paper is we kind of try to demonstrate that quickly. Mm -hmm. um, just say, you know, the Kuban operator is the backbone of this, but now what does that enable? So we looked at a control problem, we looked at an estimation problem. So um, there's two ways to approach that. One way is you just treat the Koopman operator as a black box. And you kind of say, okay, I have a black box function, but that black box function is now faster than my original dynamical system because it's basically a, a, a mapping, like a linear mapping. It doesn't involve solving a fourth order, fifth order runga kata and making sure that I have preserved accuracy. Um, the accuracy is just determined by the, by the order of the Koopman operator. Mm -hmm. And if it's black box, then I can apply black box estimation control methods and even uncertain quantification methods. So we did that in a paper. We showed, okay, you could do this. But then I think to go one level beyond that is like what structure does a coupon operator allow you to use? And that's your, I think, heading in a direction of your question. Uh, with polynomial chaos, um, essentially what you do is you, you know, there are intrusive and extr and extrusive, not intrusive mm -hmm. and intrusive methods of polynomial chaos. Uh, the non-intrusive methods are treating your dynamical system as a black box. They're kind of like data-driven methods and the intrusive yeah. methods are more analytic where that you use the form of your equations to actually derive the uncertainty quantification. I think a connection like that can be drawn with the Koopman operator. Um, and then um, beyond that, what we wanna do is like what structures within the Koopman operator allow you to efficiently compute uncertainty quantification. I think some of that literature exists. Folks have been looking at this uh, in the past. Um, but I, that's a direction I think where some of this research um, is naturally going to head in, which is, you know, like you said earlier, um, how do we compute uncertainties? For example, the higher order tensors and doing uncertainty quantification in that way, um, the Koopman operator actually allows you to calculate those analytically. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason why is because it's a completely analytic formulation and it involves polynomial and exponential functions. The exponential functions are exponential functions of complex variables, which in will include uh, the stable unstable manifold and a center manifold behavior of the dynamical system. And then the polynomial representation has to do with the fact that we have polynomial dynamics. So that's kind of the form of the equations you get. With that form, actually it turns out to be quite simple to compute a state transition tensor. Mm -hmm. um, and so we can do that. And, the, and so there's already existing methods that can use that. The difficulty in those methods is how do you compute the state transition tensor? Um, there are approaches for doing that, like differential algebra-based approaches, um, analytic differentiation approaches, um, co computer-aided uh, differentiation approaches. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. It's still a very open area of research and we're, you know, we're kind of thinking about those ideas, but we're still at the beginning stages of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and do you see also implications? Let's say now we discussed about the engineering ones, uh, uh, control, uncertainty, propagation, uh, estimation. Do you see also applications? I mean, I would say the answer is yes, in the sense that you are already applying it to understand some features of a nonlinear dynamical system, looking into a hell orbits. But do you think you can use the same formalism, for example, to 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 compute invariant manifolds and to look for low energy transfers, uh, to look for uh, trajectories leveraging chaos like ballistic capture trajectories um that's a great question about the, how to handle these chaotic systems i think you know the structures you mentioned earlier like all of these structures we i think we can do that with the coupon operator center manifold for sure we have done that in our paper we showed um that they exist 
Now the question is like how to calculate them as an actual surface in your mm -hmm. configuration space, the manifold. Uh, I think that's doable. That's not going to require a huge leap. Maybe just some slight modifications of the method to do that, but it's not going to require a huge leap to do that. There are some papers that have done things like that. So Kathy Howell and Dan Shears, um, Kathy Howell from Purdue University, Dan Shears from um, University of Colorado Boulder have methodologies for calculating the invariant tori of uh, three body problem and two body problem. And the methodologies are based on partial differential equations. And, and if you look at how their methods are formulated and um, described, you'll see ideas from the Cooper operator just there. So mm -hmm. I, I think there's clear paths for doing that. The question is, do, will we have a path for chaotic systems? And it's gonna require new methodologies and new ideas. I don't think directly with the Koopman operator mm -hmm. um, we'll have a path. We might be able with the Koopman operator to answer some theoretical questions about chaotic systems, but not necessarily what we expect as aerospace engineers, which is a mm -hmm. methodolo method uh, methodology bring principles to say something about the system, whether that's how chaotic it is or some, some property about its resonance or something along those mm -hmm. lines. Um, that might be a, a stretch and a longer term goal, um, but the direction getting there, I think, involves the eigenvalues. So, for example, there are two types of eigenvalues in the Koopman operator. There is a discrete spectrum and the continuous spectrum. Uh, the discrete spectrum, you can think about those as points, and there are points in the complex plane of, you know, for the eigenvalues, and the continuous spectrum are lines. It's thought that the continuous spectrum is related to the to the chaotic motion in dynamical systems and at the moment there aren't a lot of methodologies for extracting there are some and i won't say that there aren't any for extracting that continuous spectrum um, in an efficient way and the approach we're taking there are definitely don't exist methodologies that that take our path which is using the matrix representation for computing that because what we do is we compute the matrix representation and we and it's an infinite dimensional matrix the matrix representation of the operator we truncate that matrix so it ends up being a finite dimensional matrix you're not going to get a continuous spectrum from that mm -hmm. it's always going to be free what you could do is continue to increase the size of that matrix and hope that uh, some of your uh, discrete spectrum points are going to start lying on that continuous line and that's what you see for well-behaved systems that if you do a discrete approximation of the continuous spectrum you'll see that it's just going to lie along that line but it's well known that that kind of approach has a lot of noise mm -hmm. so you'll get spurious eigenvalues all over the place because it'll it'll um the continuous spectrum will generate some interference with the discrete spectrum um so it's very challenging um you know we're interested in pursuing that uh within my research group, but uh, I think it's we, we need to study some of the other problems first to start getting ideas on how to tackle that one. Right, right. So we still don't know how to solve this really problem, let's say, to because uh, I've been reading the the one of the works by Zebahey, uh, problems for the next millennium, something like that, and he, he he pushes a lot. Okay, we can do this. We can uh, get rid of time as an implicit dependent, explicit dependent variable sorry and uh, but yeah he underlines okay the we have a non-integrable system so we have to accept this and move forward with other things do you think there's no yeah. hope yeah i don't think the kuban operator is going to generate a, a closed form solution or something that resembles that for the three-body problem i think the hope would be to do statistical calculations with it i think I think that, okay. that that is an achievable goal, uh, potentially, actually, I'll say potentially, because I'm not sure if that's achievable, but that's the hope. And, and I definitely agree with that, um, that that's kind of what we could try to do. And then, then again, you know, the Koopman operator might not be a tool for chaotic systems. It just mm -hmm. might not, like just its properties might not mesh well. And maybe um, someone might disagree with me on that. Um, and I think there have been, actually, there have been approaches that have looked at the continuous spectrum. So if like you could start from that direction, which is approach it through the continuous spectrum. I'm not sure what the continuous spectrum, and that's, and when we talk about spectrum with the Koopman operator, it's a different idea than the frequencies I mentioned earlier for the dynamical system. 
-hmm. because, um, and I'm not gonna get too much into it just because it, it starts to get fairly complicated, but the spectrum for the Kuhlman operator isn't exactly the frequencies of the underlying dynamical system. It's it, the way to think about it is the Kuhlman operator will propagate all types of functions through your dynamical system. Any function, it'll propagate it through your dynamical system. So think about like energy. If I specify the energy of all of my initial conditions and I propagate my entire state space, how will that energy curve evolve over time? Right? You know, there's obviously, if you have some conservation of energy, there should be these um, um, manifolds of constant energies, and those manifolds are going to evolve in a certain way and they should conserve energy. But beyond, but simpler than energy, you can think about just propagating my identity variables. So the actual states, the states themselves are functions, right? They're just identity mm -hmm. functions. You know, they're a function of, of themselves, but they return themselves. So think about that as the identity functional elements and the Kuhlman operator models how to propagate that. But it's even more than that. It'll model how to propagate any function through the dynamical system. So the frequencies that are generated are frequencies for propagating any arbitrary function that you can come up with, right? Mm -hmm. So it's gonna have other frequencies in it that maybe are not relevant if, if your problem that you're interested in is the identity elements. But if you're, if you're interested in propagating fifth order functions, for example, through, a, through the three body problem, those are gonna involve very specific frequencies, right? There might be multiples of fives or something like that, or depending whether or not the continuous spectrum is involved, it could get fairly complicated. But you, you get what I'm saying, that the Kuhlman operator is approximating this very high dimensional thing. And so we gotta kind of be careful when we talk about like the frequencies that are, that are generated for the Kuhlman operator. Um, and so then, you know, whether or not we could apply it to chaotic motion, I think is, is kind of an open question because it's unclear of whether or not like a, the Koopman operator in its current form can tell us something about chaos. I think the, the, the promising direction is to make statistical arguments about chaos, which other folks have. I think there are other techniques and the Koopman operator can live within those techniques. Uh, an interesting point in which we can open up the question about the relation between stochasticity and chaos and whether yeah. we can look at chaos as a stochastic process and then sample it or the vice versa. Think about stochastic processes. Uh, like, I don't know, the space weather we discussed earlier as a manifestation of uh, chaotic behavior in the in the small scale. Yeah, um, I think so. I think so. I'm not an expert in, in chaos, um, but I, I think that, that, you know, from what I know about the literature that making progress for chaotic systems that that seems to be the right way to go because you know when you when you look at these chaotic systems um, predicting individual trajectories mm -hmm. is practically impossible or say impossible but properties about the system so like abstracting out the chaotic system a little bit and then instead of talking about individual trajectories, you talk about these general properties of the system and deriving new properties that, that you're talking about and properties that are interesting and meaningful and discuss transitions, mm. um, like meaningful and interesting transitions that the state space may go through. I th that I think is definitely uh, a direction for studying chaotic systems. I'm not an expert in chaos, you know, definitely at MIT and other institutions, we have people that are experts in, in that, but from my limited knowledge of the, the hardcore sort of chaos theory research, I think that that's definitely a direction. Um, you know, I, I think about the paper actually from uh, one of my friends and colleagues, Aaron Rosenberg, uh, University of California, San Diego. Um, he had a paper recently in the science magazine um, where they studied uh, the end body problem and they mm -hmm. found these chaotic arcs. And essentially, you know, what you could do there and what they did is they looked at ensembles of trajectories and they looked at it the right way. It's like, if you look at it through the right lens um, and the lens that they looked at are these uh, fast um, uh, dynamic indicators, uh, uh -huh. yes. essentially indicators of chaotic motion. Um, and they looked at it in the right variables, they found that in those variables, you have these consistent arcs that arise that can cause transport between uh, the inner part and outer part of the solar system, 
which was really interesting, I think, um, and signified somewhat of a breakthrough in our understanding of chaos in the n-dimensional problem, sorry, in the n-body problem. So that's kind of, I think, where my thinking is on um, where in the immediate future we can make progress. Right. right. Yeah, I'll definitely look into this because uh, I've just published on uh, celestial mechanics and dynamical astronomy a work on the use of chaos indicators for this identification of this basically boundaries between capture trajectories and not capture trajectories. Trajectory. Oh yeah, I saw that paper. Yeah, that was a, that was a nice paper. So I I think you, you know you're pursuing that sort of direction with that paper I think as well. But that's what I think right now where we can make progress. And um, uh, you know we've been focused mostly on the Koopman operator. I think even making progress in that direction um, with the Koopman operator yes. is still a bit away, a few years uh -huh. before okay. we could do that. Um, similar to what you guys were able to do. Um, I know you and Francesco Taputo uh, jointly wrote that paper, um, but I, I, I agree. I think that's a nice direction to try to address some of these chaotic problems. And, you know, we're studying it, um, you know, we're coming in from more from an engineering standpoint. I think there's folks that are studying it from more of a basic uh, and theoretical standpoint, or, or even celestial mechanics standpoint, when they're, mm -hmm. they're looking at chaos and the evolution of, of um, uh, planetary systems. For example, um, there's still a lot that we don't know about planetary systems. You know, we're detecting a lot of them with um, exoplanets, and you know, we're, we don't detect the entire system, mostly Jupiter, the Jupiter-sized planets. But we're getting, at least when we're looking very close to our neighborhood, we're getting smaller planets like Earth-sized planets. And the question is, you know, in, the, in that field, is like, how do these Jupiter-sized planets form? And I think a lot of this is understood. And how important are they? And it seems like they're very important to the formation of, of these planetary systems and they actually govern a lot of the dynamics. Um, but chaos is gonna, is re rears its, its head in, in that problem as well, um, because we're talking about such long-term evolutions, right? Mm -hmm. And so like, for example, Jack Wisdom here at MIT has been studying uh, our solar system and you know how, how long is it stable for? And he, you know, he famously, was able to use principles from chaos to know that our solar system is going to exhibit instability eventually. And in our solar, within our solar system, there is chaos. And, and he was able to show that um, observationally by looking at, at the asteroids. Um, this was done, I think, in the 60s uh, with his advisor at Caltech. OK. Yeah, I, I was aware of Shaq Laskar works, but I think those are from the 80s. So nice to, to discover there were people saying this even before. To conclude this nice conversation, please let me ask you about, I mean, it's a related question, I would say, but uh, something about, uh, I've been seeing, uh, you, you mentioned the fluid dynamics community. I've been seeing a work about the use of, uh, let's say, Koopman ideas uh, to look into the pendulum, which is a continuous spectrum system. And uh, basically, they rediscovered the, the action angle variables coming from Hamiltonian mechanics. So do you think there's something valuable to be done to connect the, the well-established Hamiltonian formalism and classical mechanics with the Koopman uh, operator perspective? And which, which then I guess answers also the previous question about the analysis of chaos. There is. Um, and so Koopman's original paper, there's some challenges there. We've been studying that problem ourselves, but Koopman's original paper kind of made some of the initial connections. And so the way to think about it is for ha Hamiltonian system, we know that volume um, is preserved. It's a symplectic system. So as it evolves, elements of volume preserved. And so what that implied for the Koopman operator, and Koopman was able to show this in his paper, is that it's a unitary operator if it does, the system is Hamiltonian. Um, and the unitary operator has additional properties. And so I, I think that that is a really interesting direction um, to study with the equipment operator. We've been looking at that direction. It's a little challenging to do. It's challenging to do because once you start looking at unitary operators and in particular Hermitian operators, it imposes additional constraints on the method. Mm -hmm. And so it worked really well for quantum mechanical systems, not so much for classical systems when you try to study those operators. But that's a particular direction that's, that we, we know that these unitary operators um, exist. The Koopman operator becomes unitary. 
becomes self-adjoint if it's Hamiltonian under additional constraints. Um, the action angle variables are particularly interesting because if you have action angle variables, um, it simplifies the Koopman operator a bit, um, but it also complicates certain things. I think for a Hamiltonian system, um, you know, it's pretty clear that the, the trajectories live on uh, a manifold, right? So if the system is Hamiltonian, then the Hamiltonian is the energy and strictly Hamiltonian, then the, ener the energy must be conserved for that system. And so, so if, you, if you specify the initial condition, then I have a conserved quantity for that system, which removes one of my degrees of freedom. And then so the dynamical system has to live on that manifold. Um, so that manifold is an interesting object, but it might be a little complicated to analyze um, from a dynamical system perspective. Formulating that manifold in action angle variables gives you the natural coordinates for that manifold. Um, so I, I think, yeah, I think that's a really interesting direction to take the Koopman operator in. We started studying it. You know, there are some theoretical hiccups um, in looking at it that way, but they're not uh, insurmountable. I think you, you can get past them. Um, you know, it's really interesting that paper you mentioned that, you know, they identify the action angle variables. I think that, that it must exist, that sort of formulation for the three-body problem and our formulation of the two-body problem has to be compatible with that. Because for our case, we have a Hamiltonian system. For the mm -hmm. two-body problem with zonal harmonics, it's Hamiltonian. If you add solar radiation pressure and um, drag, it's no longer strictly Hamiltonian. You can incorporate it. You can, so the Hamiltonian is going to be time varying. So your Hamilton's equations of motion uh, are going to be different, uh, slightly different. Um, but yeah, for the, the, the two body with zonal and the three body problem, we should have similar formulations. So I, I think that is an interesting way to, to sort of think about um, those systems. Great. Great. I mean, uh, I, I often conclude conversation like this feeling there's more work. I mean, I have more questions than when we started talking, <laughs> but today, specific, I mean, in particular, uh, yes. Uh, I mean, it, it's been a pleasure to talk with you. Uh, I hope people listening uh, got uh, an opportunity to, to, to meet you. And I mean, let me also push that this out because it's not, you, you don't often meet a professor of, uh, uh, aerospace engineering at the, one of the best institutes in the world, uh, being humble about his expertise and uh, uh, where is his limit and where colleagues have done more. So that's really something nice to see. And so, yeah, I, with this, I'd like to conclude this conversation and I thank you for your little bit. Yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for inviting me and then thank you for those kind concluding words.